So I called him and I remember just being frightened because I was like, didn't really know what to expect. And he was just the nicest person. Um, he gave me a pile of games and then he kind of told me, hey, you know what? You should start modding these games. Uh, and that was the basis of my first portfolio. Thanks so much to our episode sponsors, Hero Forge. Oh, our favorite. Welcome to Hero Forge, where your creativity knows no bounds. Whether you are a character builder, a 3D printing enthusiast, or a virtual tabletop adventurer, Hero Forge has something special just for you. You can step into their intuitive character creator where you can design stunning, high resolution characters in full 3D right in your browser. I cannot tell you how many hours of my life I have lost to enjoying this feature. With a vast library of thousands of parts and customization options, the only limit is your imagination. You can purchase your unique character designs as custom 30 millimeter scale miniatures, the perfect addition to your RPG adventures. Choose from materials like paintable plastics, rugged metal, or color plastic for vibrant, table-ready minis. Hey guys, that means you don't have to paint them yourselves, and as much as I really want to be talented enough to paint them, I just haven't been able to achieve that yet. So you can do it this way too! If you prefer 3D printing, download detailed STL files of your designs directly to your Hero Forge account. Just unzip and print at home. Super easy. For virtual tabletop enthusiasts bring your custom characters into cutting-edge programs with 3D digital miniatures. With the access key feature, seamlessly sync your miniatures with supported platforms. No downloads required. They make it so easy. But wait, there's more! If you're craving even more customization, upgrade your Hero Forge experience with a pro subscription and unlock a treasure trove of additional functions. Gain early access to upcoming products and features, export unlimited 2D digital portraits and tokens, or mesmerize your audience with the spinny mini feature. Spinny mini, that's fun to say. Showcasing your character from every angle. There is something for every adventurer at Hero Forge. Get started designing, saving, and sharing your characters today. Hero Forge, your imagination brought to life. This episode is also brought to you by Skills Hub. Whether you're a complete beginner or a seasoned professional, Skills Hub has everything you need to kickstart and advance your voice acting career. We love Skills Hub. Cannot recommend it enough. With personalized plans designed to fit your goals and aspirations, you can confidently navigate your journey in the world of voiceover. Learn which avenues best suit your unique skills and discover different ways to monetize your voice talents. From commercials to video games to audiobooks to animation, sky's the limit. Practice and refine your craft with expert design tools such as character development, accent mastery, or script interpretation. Connect directly with more than 80 vetted coaches who are top industry pros, casting directors, voice directors, and working actors to receive valuable feedback and guidance. Skills Hub is more than just a platform. It's a thriving community of voice actors, and with per-minute billing, you're in control of how much you spend. Track your progress, communicate with coaches, connect with the community, and stay motivated. Don't wait any longer to advance your voice acting career. Visit skillshub.life slash character select today to pick your path and get 20% off your first three months. Skills Hub. Come for the access. Stay for the community. Hello, 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 and welcome to the Character Select Podcast. I am Anjali Bamani. And I'm Julia Bianca. And uh, we have an extra host today, uh, Charlie TB Dodd. Oh, <laughs> yes, he very much wants to be in the podcast today. Uh, he is our positive vibe technician here at Slap Studios Los Angeles. And uh, and it's apparently bring your puppy to work day. So here we are <laughs> with our incredible guest that we are so excited to have here um, she is going to bring a, a, such a wealth of information and insight into the process of games. And she also happened to pick the performance that I would pick if I were doing this podcast as a guest. So I'm very excited to talk with her. Jacinda Chu. Hello, hello, hello. Um, I am going to slightly embarrass you real quick by reading your bio, uh, if that is all right with you. Jacinda Chu is a highly celebrated veteran of the video games industry, having worked on some of the most critically acclaimed releases of the last 20 plus years. 
Chu started her career at Killer Game as a texture artist and modeler for the studio's NCAA series. Her time with Insomniac Games as an environmental artist and art director has allowed her to put her distinct, distinctive artistic vision on the Ratchet & Clank series and Sunset Overdrive. As the current senior art director at Insomniac, she's worked on the critically lauded Marvel Spider-Man 2, Hana, which has a near-permanent spot on Metacritic's must-play list. In 2014, Polygon recognized her work on Sunset Overdrive by prophetically naming her one of the most 50 admirable people in gaming. Mm, that's awesome. Um, we're going to talk about that. Um, <laughs> one of the 50 most admirable people in gaming. Sorry, guys, I need more of this coffee. In 2018, Chu held a panel at DevCom about her journey growing the art and animation team to almost 100 members without losing the studio's boutique appeal for Marvel Spider-Man. When she isn't creating games, she's being awarded for creating them, you know, as you do. At this year's DICE Awards, Chu and her team walked away with a whopping six wins for Marvel Spider-Man 2, including Action Game of the Year and Achievement in Animation. She also graduated with a BFA in Illustration from the Rhode Island School of Design, Hala RISD. Um, your dad is an electrical engineer, which allowed you to be surrounded by PC games when you were a kid. We're going to talk about that. I want to I wanna hear all of it. So that's our moment of making you blush. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, and we want to hear more and more. How did you start with games? How did you start playing games? Was it, was it your, did your dad introduce you to them? Yeah, I mean, my dad was an electrical engineer, so he was always playing around with computers. And I think the first game I ever played was actually Pong. And, <laughs> yeah. and he made a paddle. Like, he just, it's like a little he controller. Made a paddle. And it was just like a box with a circuit board inside and it had a little dial that lets you kind of like move up and down um, so that was my first game that i played um and then the second one would be tetris so. yes of course <laughs> big fan but the funny thing about it is like we would all play tetris and then um i think we started getting we get at it so then my dad went in he changed the scoreboard so it was Dad. <laughs> oh, to keep it competitive yeah. so you kept trying to go higher amazing <laughs> we were always playing games <laughs> i love that amazing <laughs> so did you know when you were younger that that a career in gaming was an option or did you start uh somewhere else in terms of your interests i mean i i think back in the day gaming was not a real job you know mm -hmm. so it was just one of the things that i just always enjoyed doing so I was playing games, you know, throughout high school, all the way through college. And I remember when I graduated, I graduated with an illustration degree, which, you know, to those who know, that's like 2D, like <laughs> painting and illustrating, drawing. Um, and I really couldn't find a job because if you looked at the job listings back in the day, there was nothing called illustrator. Right. You know? Right. Um, and I remember just like laying on the ground going, what am I going to do? And then one of my friends was like, why don't you just do video games? Like you play them all the time. And I was like, oh, I don't know what it's going to take. Be, I don't even know. Um, and they actually had a friend who was um, a producer at Capcom. Wow. And I remember um, telling them um, that, oh, I don't, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to meet this friend. Like, here's this phone number. Just call him. So I called him. And I remember just being frightened because I was like, didn't really know what to expect. And he was just the nicest person. Um, he gave me a pile of games. And then he kind of told me, hey, you know what? You should start modding these games. Um, and that was the basis of my first portfolio. Um, and I also think to this day, I also tend to try to help as many game developers as I can, just because like, if it wasn't for somebody who over 20 years ago, just, you know, talked to someone that didn't know it all, uh, but he was just so enthusiastic about games, I would never have been able to start. So, so that was like how I got my, uh, my portfolio started. We, we talk about this a lot, like the most talented people we know are also the most generous with their knowledge and reaching down and pulling other people up the ladder across every medium, I think. It's not obviously not just in games, and it's, um, I know as a woman in gaming, I'm sure it was incredibly challenging as well, so to have someone be a champion right away is so, so, so special. Did you feel any kind of pushback during your, your time, you know, starting in games? Um, not, not really. And I mean, to your point, actually, I've had an amazing um, number of mentors throughout my career. And I just think I've been super fortunate, you know, from that first phone call um, to, you know, in Insomnia Games, I had just incredible art directors that were always really positive, always pushing me, uh, but also being very supportive. You know, um, they always just told me to, you know, follow my instincts up that they would always support me. 
um, to the point to where I am now, where I think, you know, a lot of them are still there and still supporting me. Um, and I just think it's really hard to sometimes skin these kinds of industries unless you get that kind of support system. So I feel absolutely. very, very fortunate. And absolutely. Yeah, I, f- I feel the same way, especially with you, with this one right here, who's like the, she is the master connector. She is, uh, <laughs> she is. I, I have a friend who we call the queen of Facebook, and I feel like you are the queen of the gaming network. I don't know anything that you have. You don't have some kind of connection to it's. I, I think it's about the passion, kind of what you were talking about when, like, that person was eager to provide that information, just like you're eager to provide that information, and we're eager to provide that information. I think it, A, it comes from an abundance mindset and not being threatened by people, you know, younger and talented. Mm-hmm. Um, but, it, but it's also about, in this industry, I think because there's so much passion behind it, when you find someone who's, like, really excited about games, you're like, oh, my people (laughs) you just want to share with them too so i i find it like if someone is that passionate then i'm happy to give my time because it 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 will it will come back tenfold into the industry Um, and there's been some amazing people that have i'm sure come out of your mentorship as well oh yeah yeah. (laughs) the amount the number of things that people have gone on to do that i've mentored in my career is just incredible like starting their own companies like just Crazy. And it's just amazing. I always tell them, just remember me when they're famous. Yeah. Nah. <laughs> you and me both. It's kind of hard to forget with all of the things that you have worked on, too, though. I mean, what what made you take the jump from where you are, where you started with illustration to where you are now? Was it a, ste- was it a straight path? Was it? Um, well, I think back in the day, um, I think video games was almost more like an apprenticeship. So if you talk to anyone who's been in the industry for over 20 years, a lot of times they'll say something like, oh, I was an aerospace engineer and I knew a person who wanted me to learn a program. Um, so my trajectory is very much like that. Um, I kind of dabbled in at Photoshop and Illustrator in college. Um, and, and again, that wasn't widely used um, as it is compared to today. So um, I started you know, entry level at this job and I just they were just like, hey, can you just start painting textures, just painting, um, basically I was doing basketball jerseys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the funny thing about it, as a, as a side note, um, was we also didn't have a very highly developed internet as we do now. So we actually had to look at VHS tapes, Oh wow! Like, um, pause them uh, with the VCR, and then I would have, to, it'd be like shaking, right? Because it's paused. And then I would have to try to uh, figure out what colors the jerseys wore, try to figure out what the... Um, the logos were on the jersey. Good Lord. It was just so low tech. What game was this? This was a Final Four. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's from the NCAA. Mm-hmm. That's a basketball game. Yeah, yeah. Oh, That's gosh, so funny. <laughs> VHS tapes. Okay. Yeah. You know, this is definitely a segue to go on, but I just, it's such a, um, a testament to me hearing you talking about that and hearing so many um, actors nowadays complaining about self tapes yeah. <laughs> and realizing that no matter what, like, you had to learn to do the thing that you learned to do from a very, like, that is not an ideal situation, (laughs) right? But that was the technology, and that was the way things were going and the way you had to evolve. And I think one of the things that is a challenge but that must be met by people, especially in the gaming industry and especially actors who may be frustrated by having to know how to do so many more things than act now it is part of the evolution. It is part of what makes us, it, if you don't move along with it, yes, you can complain about it, but then someone else is going to be an early adopter and, and you're not going to be able to get those jobs. Yeah. Well, so yeah. if you love the thing you do, ideally speaking, you are willing to do whatever it takes to learn what you need to do to be able to tell those stories in your medium. And with your medium being illustration and your medium being art, you just, you didn't, you did the needful, yeah. as, as Indian folks like to say, to do the needful. Well, and I'm curious about that tech progression, kind of, of, like, what tools you were using from VHS to, like, yeah. now and and how many programs you've had to burn through and how yeah. much tech you've had to review just to get to even what you're using now. Well, I think that's the funny thing because, you know, um, people are like, kids these days have it so easy because, I mean, my portfolio was an actual reel. <laughs> Was we used to have to send VHS tapes to uh-huh. prospective employers, and sometimes they'd get mangled in the mail. I mean, this was a real thing. We didn't get to send links to, to people. Um, and then also on one of the first games I worked on, um, it would take almost 24 hours for you to see anything you did in the game and have it appear 
in the game. Any update now to twenty first because that's how much it took to compile all the code to, to they'll see it. Um, and nowadays it's almost instantaneous and a lot of engines, you know. So again, it's it's definitely changed a lot. And the big thing for um, us is, you know, probably going it's from going to two D, you know, pixel games. Um, to 3D because 3D modeling yeah. was a big thing, and now obviously 3D is 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 still where it's at. Um, and uh, you know, from there, I think we've now gone on to proceduralism. You know, where everything is. Um, you know, we try to do like very um, kind of like the repetitive tasks. We try to create tools to make them less repetitive. Um, so, for example, if we're trying to build a city, and instead of having artists place a lamppost, you know, every like <laughs> every hundred hundred feet, there's going to be a lamppost or something. Uh, we actually make it so that the tool will just place it for you. you know? mm-hmm. So things that are predictable now, we have tools that will just make it easier. So I think now we can do way more complex things because of the tools we have. Amazing. Okay, so that's a perfect uh, segue for me to just ask if you can just tell us a little bit about what you do. <laughs> <laughs> I question that. <laughs> what are you doing? Don't we all? <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> um, so I'm the senior art director, um, you know, from Marvel's and Spider-Man Two. I'm in Marvel Spider-Man One, and I am in charge of the overall uh, look of the game from a visual standpoint. And specifically, um, that will include characters, environment, lighting, um, and effects. Um, and even there's a little bit of uh, UI that also falls under the art department. Um, and that's actually a huge. Uh, department, so I can't take credit for all of it. It's just kind of all under, um, yeah. But there's a huge uh, group of people who do all this stuff. Um, and then I also work very closely with the animation director because animation is actually another department, and I don't think people always understand that because I think we tend to conflate art and animation. Mm-hmm. Um, so I work very closely with the um, animation director and the animation team because how something moves, how it performs, as we're going to talk about today is very closely tied to the art that it's on. Mm -hmm. Um, But we are two separate departments. Very cool. Okay. Mm -hmm. One of the conversations that we had that really struck us when we were were doing the the panel that inspired us to do this podcast talked very specifically about how the art and the animation really affect how the performance comes across from a particular actor, that it's not... It's it's so much about the environment and about the animation... Um, setting that scene and I, I really think we take it for granted both as players and as performers how much that can affect something also if you haven't played Spider-Man I 2 was, was let's just, just take a moment okay even if you are not good at first person shooters like someone who is on this podcast that is not Julia or Jacinda it's not it's not even it's a, it's more like adventure yeah it's swinging. more exactly it's adventure and the cutscenes. If you take all of those cutscenes and put them all together, it is a movie. I wish it's yeah. extraordinary. I wish there was a movie mode. Patrick and I have talked about this. Yeah. Like I would prefer to sometimes consume in movie mode, but I understand I don't want to take away from the game. Right. And um, I, don't, I, don't, but, I don't want to take it away from that that sense of agency that mm-hmm. you get when you step into it. Like it is really fun to be like I'm going to watch the movie, now I'm going to do the thing. Yeah. And then I'm going to step out and watch and take a break, and now I'm going to do the thing. I love that. Maybe Just it's my character. Mode. I feel like my character only has, she has a lot more stuff in the, now I'm going to do the thing part, so i, I got to hang on to that. Fair. you got to hang on Fair. to that. Fair. But that, I mean, having seen many games this year, and lots of games that won a ton of awards that are varying, like, I mean, even just seeing a game like Dave the Diver coming up and winning so much stuff is really cool because we want to see innovation and yes. and, uh, and different things. But it's so beautiful. It's gorgeous. It's so beautiful. I the I had the privilege of getting a little preview right the day it came out in the Insomniac Theater, um, and I was shown one of the Craven scenes. And I just, I, it, people do not understand the level of art. And so just an incredible job, Jacinda. Like seriously, and I know it's your whole team and and everything, but like really, I think that everyone, and of course the awards agreed that like achievement in art, that game is everything. It's extraordinary. Everything. And, and while we know you have a team, and what, again, one of the things that we always want to talk about on this show is how we are a cog in a very big wheel. Part of having that team is leading them well. Yeah. And, and that is not a skill that everybody has. So, obviously, you are largely responsible. So, yeah, good job. Just <laughs> so, okay, so 
thing is, thanks, thanks for the game. Good job. We like it. A plus, A plus work. Uh, um, speaking of iconic games and performance, oh, you have one more question. No, ask. Um, I would love to talk a little bit about your role in um, in selecting actors in performances and yeah. and where you come into play. Just. Uh, with characters, and a character obviously is part of your domain and the look of the character. And so, um, I fortunately have been able to work with you on Spider-Man, and uh, and that's one of the reasons that I wanted to talk to you is because I thought it would be really interesting to discuss your role in that room. Um, you know, mine as a casting director is to bring in uh, people who who can do an amazing performance, bring their own unique uh, sensibilities to these roles. But once it goes out of my hands and into that, especially callback room, especially for a performance capture role, um, is usually what we're talking about. They do a lot of scanning and whatnot. Um, so I just kind of wanted to talk about, like, when do they get you involved with characters? And, and then what does that process look like? Oh, well, there's there's two types of characters in games. Um, one is um, a retargeted character and one that's a digital double. And that's largely why I'm involved. Um, a digital double is basically so we scan one to one. So we use that um, actor's performance as well as their likeness. So if you think about someone like um, our uh, Nolan, Norman Osborne, who's played by Mark Rolston, amazingly, <laughs> he is a, a digital double because we have used his likeness. Um, but um, oftentimes we have characters who are retargeted. And that means that we are taking the performance and the VO from the actor, but we are not taking the likeness. And obviously, um, like Yuri Longdahl, who plays our Peter Parker, mm -hmm. is a great example of that. Uh, we did not use his likeness for Peter, um, but we used his performance. So I'm in the room because I am evaluating uh, the actor's faces. It's a really weird job. Um, <laughs> I know Julia's been there when I've made some comments about people and, and, and how they're acting or how they look. Um, but I'm really um, looking to see how they may kind of translate into like a digital you know, character. Um, and that's what I'm evaluating them for. I mean, there's a lot of people never going to be evaluating for performance, but I'm really there to look at how they look. <laughs> and it's kind of an uncomfortable job sometimes. But um, what am I looking for? Is it probably the next yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Also, I would just like to, for those of you actors out there who are like, oh my God, she's evaluating my face. Evaluating and judging are not the same thing. Yes. <laughs> evaluating by a set of criteria that have nothing to do with your talent or your good looks has nothing to do with judging you. So please, please understand that. This is a this is a science that she's working with. And it's nothing you have control over. Yeah, that too. <laughs> that too. And, and I think the other thing is too, we're also evalu evaluating how much work it might be too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, because um, from a technical point of view, there's a lot of things we can do. And then the more we have to touch the scan, the more we have to change something, just the more handwork we have to do. Um, and I'll use like a really small example like you know when we we're um, working with um, uh, Mr. Negative um, he's a one-to-one -one. so again we use the actor's likeness Stephen O. Young and because this is a Marvel movie and everyone has to look super heroic uh, we just basically you know gave him a slightly square jaw just slightly it you know does it change him at all most people can't even tell that we did it mm -hmm. but it just makes him look slightly more heroic mm -hmm. so that's something that's easy for us to change we're like oh you know we could probably just do a little like this he'll look a little bit more like the the comic book character um in other times there might be things where what makes somebody look very unique in real life may not translate very well into a digital character and those are things i have to look at too like well how complicated um are the eyelids on this person and, and how, how you know, and, and is that something we want to reproduce digitally? Um, is that something that we uh, feel really strongly about? So I'm just really there to give that kind of information because sometimes, honestly, if the performer is incredible, that's not going to stop us. Right. Yeah. You know, we're going to cast that person, but I'm normally the, the one whispering in the corner kind of saying, oh, you know, I think this person would probably make a, a better candidate um, for scanning. Um, and then I think lastly, which again, um, our animation director can take it or leave it. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm also looking at um, performance, but in from a technical sense, because I think what often happens is sometimes when you hire folks from maybe VO or TV, they're kind of on opposite uh, spectrums, but um, they sometimes are not body aware too. Mm -hmm. So what's kind of funny is like, you know, if you have a, a funny thing, like you slouch a lot, you know, which, hey, I'm slouching right now. So. <laughs> you and me both. Yeah. <laughs> Not a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, if your character is, is slouching, 
um, that comes in when you're on the mocap stage. And mm -hmm. it's something we have to remove by hand, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we can probably automate some of it, but it's just kind of one more thing to consider. Um, there's other funny nervous tics that people have too, like maybe you swallow a lot you know, or you lick your lips, you know, blank a lot. Yeah, but it's just funny things like, again, all the things that I do, so not yes. a knock on, on the actor, but it's just something that, oh gosh, you know, if we cast that person, that's just something we're going to have to be aware of, and we'll probably have to knock it out, you know, by hand, you know, or animators have to touch all that. So it's it's that kind of thing that I'm, I'm, I'm kind of looking for, and I'm just providing another side for um, all the folks in the room to make their decision, sure. you know, because they can say, we that's fine, we still want to cast this person. And I'm like, okay, I'm just taking her. <laughs> just taking those in the, the process tour, later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay. Another reason why, and, and we've talked about this, Julia and I, a lot of, about um, theater training oh, yeah. and how that yeah. really serves you, not just in voiceover, but absolutely yeah. in performance capture. Because yeah. I feel like uh, performance capture, motion capture, all of it is, is, it is an amalgam of TV and film and theater in a way that nothing else is. If you are used to doing eight shows a week and being aware of where you are in space and aware of how your body moves in front of that audience, you're going to have a hell of a easier time dealing with that suit and that camera on your head and the gazillion cameras in the room than necessarily someone who has been depending on camera angles yeah. to solve things. Yeah. So um, movement training and theater training really, really, really does serve you. It's. I think it's pretty incredible that there is a, there to me is a, a closer connection between theater and games than necessarily television and games. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and television is really, really funny because we'll uh, go through casting with television um, actors and I think with television, you get the really big close up, and some can do the Clint Eastwood squint for like yes. 10 seconds <laughs> yeah. and hold. And it's incredible on TV, but in games, you're, everyone's like, is is the game broken? Is the game broken? You know, why happens? is this person? Is this a bug? Right? You guys yeah. <laughs> need to get to the next fighty part. <laughs> so, for in that respect, it's almost too subtle sometimes mm -hmm. for video games if, yeah. if you're kind of more used to the television style, too. Um, but we see that sometimes with television um, after you. So, um, I don't know, it's, it's funny. It's, again, games is a very funny medium, but you're absolutely right. Like, theater actors are the best. Mm -hmm. I used to love uh, theater actors. Shout out Northwestern Wildcat Theater Department. <laughs> <laughs> I just had to because I could. <laughs> Um, speaking okay. of, now we're ready. Yes, now we're ready. And also speaking of people with some incredible stage presence, um, yes. we, uh, you have chosen to talk about uh, Abby Anderson from The Last of Us Part Two, portrayed by our beloved Laura Bailey. So I'm going to read Abby Anderson's bio, and then we're going to get crack -hoo. Abigail Abby Anderson was introduced in The Last of Us Part II as a playable co-protagonist along with the returning character Ellie Williams. As a child, she was part of the Fireflies along with her father, but would later become part of the Washington Liberation Front, one of several factions that formed in direct response to the failures of the government-ran militia group FEDRA, who were supposed to take care of survivors of the fungal outbreak, but instead imposed draconian law. Abby was not featured in much of the promotional material, save for one trailer at Paris Games Week 2017, which was criticized for its gore and violence. People also couldn't help but notice the lack of the series' beloved characters. There wasn't an appearance from Ellie, and the continued absence of Joel Miller from trailers drew speculation about the size of his role in the game. Though Abby's voice and motion capture performance is provided by prominent voice actress Laura Bailey, she is modeled physically after two different actresses. For her face, she's modeled after an employee who worked at Naughty Dog at the time, the game's developer named Jocelyn Mettler. Her muscular physique is based on that of CrossFit athlete Colleen Futch. Abby was praised by critics and gamers alike for her well-roundedness, showing both a ruthlessness, stoic side, along with a compassionate, vulnerable side. The realistic complexity of the character lent to exploring themes of revenge, perspective, and the consequences of one's actions through her parallel narrative with Ellie. We are going to do our best to not spoil things uh, as much as possible for those of you who have not played the game or do not know the story of the game. But there are some things that, unfortunately, it, we would not be able to talk about this character <laughs> without talking about. So if you're spoiler worried about alert. spoilers, here's your spoiler alert. Now is the time. Seize the day. Press pause. Go play the game and come on back. <laughs> we'll see you in two weeks um, when you finish playing the game. Um, so yes, I, and I want to stand corrected because although Laura, once again, although Laura is credited with the performance and she does an incredible job, like you said, there are other people that it is modeled after. 
um, both in terms of her body performance and her facial capture. So um, talk to us about why you chose this particular character and this performance. And, and as we all know, uh, Laura Bailey also played our Mary Jane Watson. Yes, so. yes. <laughs> we're big fans. Laura Bailey is a queen. Yes. yes. Um, <laughs> I specifically love Abby just because it. if you met Laura Bailey in real life, she's not a large person, you know? Um, so Abby to me is just very different from her physically. Mm -hmm. So that's one. Um, and then secondly, to me, Abby is very difficult to pull off because she is somebody who um, has a very challenging role in the game. I'm trying not to completely yeah. spoil it. Um, but you also need to get the, the player to have sympathy for her, mm -hmm. you know, just and for her to play someone who's really tough, um, who can sometimes be gruff, but also to play her soul uh, in such a vulnerable way is something that I find incredible. And one of the things that we just talked about, too, is that I think Laura is very, very body aware. And I just yeah. I just think she's just one of the best because no matter who she plays, you know, whether it's somebody like MJ, who's just like a fraction uh, of um, it, physical presence that Abby has, or you know, someone like Abby, who's a very physical character, Laura is able to command the stage and to actually perform um, full body um, um, in that role. Mm -hmm. And... One of the things that's also very tough, too, is like, you know, and I'll talk about one of our characters like Craven, for example, who's yeah. like this huge, very physical, um, you know, enemy that we have in the game. Um, but he's a really big guy. And mm -hmm. if someone who's very short or skinny play that character, it'd be really hard to move like that. Mm -hmm. But Laura moves with such presence yeah. um, on um, the mocap stage uh, to embody Abby. And obviously there's other mocap um, actors who long to do this, you know, I'm sure a lot of stunts. I don't think Laura did this time. <laughs> we can check that. Um, but she has to be able to perform as Abby and a move like Abby. And she does that so well. Mm -hmm. And when I'm watching Abby's performance in the game, I just don't notice or don't think that she's Laura. You know, and mm -hmm. I, I mean, obviously that's a sign of a good actor. Mm -hmm. But the, you cannot, um, you know, just, you have to just remember how physical that role really is. And the mm -hmm. fact that she could do that, I think it's also just incredible. Um, so that's my technical take on it. No, I, I love it. And I love that you brought that up because, again, this is something that I, I don't even think of out loud unless I'm playing a role that is physically not m me. And but, but I wouldn't even think to talk about that in a situation like this because it is such a challenge. Carry, it is such a challenge to convey weight and size if you are not necessarily in that position. It is such a, a to, to, to not only change your voice, but just change the, literally the center of gravity um, that you might be carrying as that character and how that would shift the character and how that would shift how they sound and how they move. Um, and also just, uh, you, you point this out and it's one of my favorite things about playing any kind of antagonist is finding a way to make that character sympathetic um, and, and I agree, Laura has, uh, she, she is so emotionally accessible mm -hmm. and so capable of playing so many layers of things at the same time. And, and there are very few people who can do that while also not being the physical manifestation of that character. Yeah. Yay, games. Yeah, like, exactly. I just, Thank I just God for love, games. I just love that we can have the conversation about how someone can play something so outside of their physicality, yeah. or not physicality, of their physical presence, but, yeah. but be able to perform it. I mean, that's like goals, right? Yeah. That every actor's dream would be to be yeah, able to it, play something so far from yourself yeah. and yeah. be able to do it with such presence and and, uh, and weight even. Yeah. And that's when we depend on folks like you in your department to be able to take Trans whatever, yeah, to be able to translate whatever we have given, which is hopefully enough for you to work with and then turn that into something bigger. I'm also thinking of Sam Bayard in, mm -hmm. in oh my game. Girl. Like the game. You know, like she's, she, uh, her physicality is obviously not the same as Carlock, but the, but the way she was able to, with the performance director, find that physicality um, and find that voice is is so special. Um, yeah, I I I am hesitating because I the only reason I'm hesitating is because I could go on for hours and hours <laughs> about how much I love this performance and how grateful I am that it was so um, so critically lauded and that people really really understood um, the depth to which she had to go to make that character to make that character who they are. 
and to make that character someone that people could sympathize with despite their actions. <laughs> no comment. No comment. <laughs> <on> <laughs> their actions. You're going to have to play the game. Um, were there any other things in, in particular? Like, were there moments in the game that you remember uh, that struck you besides the end? <laughs> Which I guess, you know, that's obviously the big moment, but <laughs> I, you know, I loved her um, interactions with Yara and Lev. Also, like, mm -hmm. I love those two characters, you know, but to show her, um, her personality, um, her, again, her, her vulnerability with those characters, like, um, and how much she cares, because she, she goes out of her way to, to help them in the game. Um, I love that aspect of her performance as well. Um, but then there's also funny things about her performance too because let's not forget the humor too mm -hmm. yeah. and that's the other thing I think that's really hard to to get not only is the compassion the vulnerability the toughness the gruffness but then there's just moments of levity which I find really amusing because Abby actually has a, a fear of height so um, there's a couple scenes where you know other characters are joking with her um, and trying to you know tease her about her fear of heights and she manages to you know kind of you know tell them just to lay off and stuff, but she's clearly really scared, yeah. you know? Um, and I just love that ab about Laura's performance as well. I just think kind of getting that feel too. And it's, uh, they're also funny sometimes too. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. um, Lev will poke fun at her and ask her about her relationship with Owen, you know, mm -hmm. and when she's freaking out, right, when she's climbing over the, um, um, she, in one of the missions she has to, she's high up and she, they're really high up basically. She's really scared out of her wits, you know? But I think just that level of humor too is I think is difficult to play. It's a very Bambi is a very complex character, mm -hmm. and I think Laura is able to carry the full range of emotions and experiences she has to go through. Mm -hmm. And over like I mean, did they record that over like two years or something like that? I mean, yeah. it, it was a long process. I was much more on the um, like dialogue recording side, but it was definitely um, a long time to be in that type of headspace yeah. and and also like. Yeah continuity because they do like you know a few weeks at a time mm -hmm. go back process you know and then you know go back in and and to just kind of go in and out of those spaces and do it with such consistency yeah. is pretty incredible yeah it's it's so far from what we do on television or film where we would usually have the benefit of it being a concentrated time and if you're lucky you're on a set where they're filming it chronologically but even if that's not the case you it's a, a it's a compact period of time rather than Here's a few weeks. Now we have to go away and let everybody behind the scenes w work with the art and work with the animation and everything. Okay, now you're going to come back six months later um, and then try to dive right back into it. And you've had six months of life experience and you have all of these other things. So, again, like, kudos to her for being able to. Kudos is such a tiny... Name. <laughs> Just, like, a complete awe and reverence to her for being able to do what she did with that. And... Uh, and thankfully, BAFTA acknowledged it. Yeah, for sure. Well. And, the, and the art team behind her. Indeed, <laughs> indeed, indeed, the art team behind her. Um, are there any particular games that you are looking forward to seeing come out uh, that you can actually talk about? Oh, geez. I'm, I mean, I don't know what's actually been announced, you know? <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> I mean... I know that's a that's a tricky question to ask because people are I think people are always asking like like what you got coming up I'm like can't talk about it for four years yeah. I'm sorry games I want to come out <laughs> yes just, um, yes I'm I'm really intrigued by um, Amy Hed Hennig's um, Marvel game which is called 19 and I'm gonna mess up the name so I'm not gonna say it but her the trailer dropped recently yeah and that looks um, incredible and I always love her as a storyteller mm -hmm. um, so I'm very interested in in that game oh um, yeah and obviously I'm just loving and hoping that I'll get sequels to all my favorite games in yeah, because I love, you know, God like of, what? God of War. I yeah. love God of War. I can't mm -hmm. wait for the next one. Hopefully there's a next one. Hopefully there's a next one. And that one is mm -hmm. talk about beautiful. Yeah. God, that one, that's another beautiful one. Yeah. Do yeah. you get to like, um, party with other art directors and tell them how awesome they are too. Yeah. Like, like, go you guys hang out. Like, she we hang art out. directors and, uh, and uh, Last of Us art directors. <laughs> you know, that's a good question. I mean, the funny thing about art directors, um, because people always ask me how to become an art director. Yeah, the sure. art director school. Um, most projects only have one, mm -hmm. you know, so mm -hmm. it's kind of like they're this, like, like, unicorn you know right. you're like the only one at your studio and stuff so we don't actually hang out that often <laughs> i mean 
at our studio, luckily, we actually have a lot of art directors now. I just think I realized this um, a couple couple of years ago that why is there only ever one? Mm-hmm. So we actually have multiple leads. We have multiple art directors, and we all specialize in things. And I think that actually helps us all be better. Yeah. Um, but in the Sony family group, like, yes, we kind of do, like, hang out sometimes. And it just depends, like, why you need to... To talk to somebody, right, know, or who tech, you, or yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, maybe who you like um, hit it off with, you know. Mm-hmm. So I mean, I've been hanging out with um, the girl art director, I he's a studio art director for for a while now. It's just I don't know. I think we've just kind of run each other enough that you know, <laughs> she's on mm-hmm. speed dial, you know. Awesome. Um, but the other thing that's great about game developers is like anytime you reach out, like everyone's always just so happy to talk to you, mm-hmm. like you know. So if you ever have a question. Um, they'll have, they're happy to answer it. Unfortunately, I'm, I can ask them when the game's going to ship, but they won't yeah. tell me. <laughs> Fair, just like the rest of us. Yeah. Yeah. So ones are coming out, can't tell you. Yeah. <laughs> no idea. Um, I was going to say, too, I, I, I didn't want to, um, I almost forgot about Laura. One more thing. I, I, of course. I didn't want to talk about I totally forgot. Um, Laura's actually also got really good Sacial performance too. Mm. Um, excuse me, I almost forgot to to mention that because I was just so excited just talking about Abby. But um, I think in and I'd have to look back at Laura's resume. But I think for the most part, Laura typically doesn't have a digital double character like a, a game where she plays herself. And the fact that she's able to play such an incredibly broad range of characters um, who don't look anything like her physically, you know, and obviously the face in the face as well, shows you how clean her acting is and when mm-hmm. I say clean mm-hmm. I'm talking about from an animation and, a, yeah. and an artistic point of view like her expressions I think are just really good right and they translate really well because I think they're just very precise mm-hmm. and from an art and an animation point of view that's that's gold right there and she's again one of the, the queens I would say when it comes to just having these great facial expressions and I wish I could say it in a more scientific way of like <laughs> why it is that she translates so well to different faces that look don't look anything like hers. Um, but I don't know how else to explain it. Oh, that's mm-hmm. the magic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's like the magic. You can't explain away the magic of Laura Bailey. It's just the magic <laughs> of Laura Bailey. I think also, um, I mean, I know it's not in video games, but the work that she has done in the DTRPG community mm-hmm. and embodying so many different characters of completely different sizes, so completely different backgrounds. and. And, and if you watch her on any of her shows, if you watch her on Critical Role, you'll see her doing that very same thing where, no, she doesn't look like a, a tiny blue tiefling in real life, but her facial expressions for that character are completely different than her facial expressions for the character she might be playing now. And I think those two things definitely inform each other. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Do you have any piece of advice or guidance that you would offer to anyone who's interested in becoming an art director or interested in following in your footsteps in terms of being an illustrator and then moving into the art department? Um, I I think nowadays it's really important to just start with a craft, you know, Mm -hmm. because I think for an art director um, to do a job well, you really have to understand what it means to make game from beginning to end Mm -hmm. Um, because I think sometimes when I talk to students and they just want to come out of school and become the art director Mm -hmm. (laughs) it it doesn't really work that way it's better to have a couple games under your belt and um, oftentimes um, I'm going to say the craft doesn't matter as much I'm just going to throw that out there I'm going to make a that's my bet (laughs) I can't speak for all the other studios out there but you know whether you're a character modeler environment artist um, you know concept artists, even a lighter. Um, there's just a lot of crafts. I think they're kind of related to mm-hmm. art direction. Um, and often what hap- times what happens is because a lot of our um, skills are very related, um, you start kind of just learning them as you go. That's mm-hmm. kind of what happens. Yeah. Like maybe if you're doing environment art, you learn more about lighting because you got to work so much with the lighter who's, who's lighting the environment. And then you start working with the effects artists who are also putting the effects in your environment. And then if you kind of start getting really good and you become an art lead or an artistic leader, eventually you can get um, your way to an art director. Um, but art direction, I think, is this weird kind of apprenticed like mm-hmm. kind of job because there's no major for it. Right. Um, and that's kind of the other thing that's really hard, too, is people ask me, like, well, how did you get to be it? You know, and I was like, well, there's this kind of Game of Thrones. <laughs> 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 but I think having, uh, I think making it known that you want to um, be an art director at the company you're at, 
um, also helps too, because maybe you can find somebody who's willing to mentor you or give you a chance, you know. Uh, and obviously, I think talking to other art directors in the industry really helps. But it's really getting the opportunity, I think, to, um, you know, try it out um, and to get mentoring is, is really um, what you really need, unfortunately, to be an art director. I wish it was more scientific. Um, <laughs> I actually yeah. love that it's not more. <laughs> well, no, I think it's absolutely yeah. I think you're you're um, missing a piece, which is your uh, your mentorship and your leadership is yeah. obviously a huge factor of that. Because if you're not going to become the director or lead if you're not able to lead people. Yeah. And so you can work your way up, but it's teamwork, it's collaboration, and it's making all of those other artists feel like they're getting their say. And, and then also getting that mentorship and making sure that those people who are above you at the time trust your sensibilities. Because, right, that's what it's all about is there isn't anything scientific. It's did you approve and get to this end product that is beautiful <laughs> that everyone says together is what we were aesthetically going for right and if they can trust your sensibilities but i think that leadership is such a huge portion of it and it's obvious that you've uh, mentored and led many many people to be great at their positions and that's part of the reason that you're in charge <laughs> I, it actually brings up a, a really good point because one of the things I always ask people who want to become art directors, I say, what do you think is the most important um, skill that you need to be an art director? And everyone always says, artistic vision. <laughs> <laughs> and then I always say, wrong. Yeah. Um, because the por most important thing isn't actually artistic vision, at least from my experience. I think the most important thing is actually be able to get that vision into the game. Mm -hmm. And that does have to do with um, communication um, and leadership, um, and then also just understanding how the game is made. And the communication part isn't actually even just, you know, be able to communicate well with people. It's be able to explain the art to somebody or explain what you're thinking in your head. Um, it's actually not as easy as you might think. And I think that's kind of the one thing that a lot of people don't always understand because they just kind of feel like, oh, I've had this great idea and everyone will just listen to me when I'm the art director. And I was like, ooh, yeah. that's not how my job went. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> that's not that way for any kind of director. Right, well, know? I mean, I think in film, there's a little more flexibility for the director to kind of own the end mm -hmm. product, if mm -hmm. you will. But like in games, I mean, yes, there's a game director, there's a creative director, yeah. they're gonna get, but they're managing so many yeah. processes that, yeah, yeah. Oh, and, incredible. And I, I think a lot of it too is actually trying to understand. Um, I always say that like the art director is also a translator because you know you're getting feedback from you know the creative director the game director you know there's always a writer you know mm -hmm. um let alone the publisher so everyone always has an idea right so i always have to like hear what they're saying and try to understand what it means to the art because a lot of times people don't say what they really mean because mm -hmm. they may not be artists you know um, so I can't just literally do what everyone says. That's yeah. very relatable for casting. Sure. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, it's it's yeah. definitely translating the yeah. vision for the character, and then, uh, but I find it's probably easier because I'm not trying to explain to a bunch of people. I'm just seeing what I get, and I'm saying I think all of these are within the yeah. the barrel of what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. So I, I mean, it's so funny because you're so good at your job. I just like love the the people you, you bring us every time. It's mm -hmm. amazing. It's my favorite thing. <laughs> but you're so right. I it's it's funny because often as when a lot of people are talking, I talk a lot less, you know, because I don't like talking about art so much. I actually like listening, mm -hmm. you know. And I some people just talk forever about art, and I think it's the funniest thing. Um, but I just like hearing and absorbing. And then you're right. You kind of form a dartboard of like, okay, I think everyone's thinking this, you know. And then you just kind of like um, hone it down, right? Mm -hmm. You just kind of pass to everybody and you get more like funny feedback and then you just like <laughs> narrow it down and narrow it down until you finally get the thing, you know. At the most beautiful game of 2020. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, I, have to, I have to say something for those of you who aren't um, watching this, who are just listening to the podcast, but through this whole time that we have been talking, one of the most remarkable things about talking with you is how much your joy and love for what you are doing and the people you are talking about shines through your facial expression. Like, it is so clear that you just, you belong here doing this thing, and it's so clear that you love it, and that's obviously a big reason why you're so good at it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's, it's so clear. It's so clear. 
Well, I, I think we have to move on with our days and let you go make more amazing video games as much as uh, I want to sit here and chat with you the whole time. Where can people find you if there are places you want them to find you? Where can people find you on the, on the interwebs? Gosh, I mean, you can find me on... Like, don't. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't find me. I have enough to do. You can find me on uh, Instagram or... Yeah. Um, or um, sorry, X, formerly known as Twitter. I can't. <laughs> yes, I can't do it. I can't do it. I don't care what anyone says. I really, I can't bring myself to say it. I can't bring myself to do it. But it's just just send it to you. I think I might have even put an underscore in there somewhere. Okay. But I don't think there's that many of us. So, share sure, <laughs> fine. Fair. Share, fair, fair. Well, it's been so wonderful talking about you and talking about one of my favorite performances as well. Um, thank you so much for spending the time with us. Thank you so much for your insights so many things that even like i'm i'm again i love doing this podcast partly because i get to chew on new things yeah i'm gonna take a lot of what you said and take it into my next study <laughs> <laughs> that's what i'm gonna do all right Thank guys you, you so know much. you know the drill uh uh please like and subscribe and share and comment and do all the things um i'm gonna point in a bunch of directions <laughs> as usual and hopefully pop-ups will come up on the screen uh you can find us obviously on uh where you podcast are listened to you guys on Apple Podcasts on Spotify you can join us for the weekly YouTube premieres uh, of the video of the show you can find us on Patreon and join us and get some ad free episodes and get them the day before along with um, oh Charlie is chiming in on that one he's very <laughs> he big says, he says join the, join the Patreon because <laughs> I will shake and my collar will make noise um, yes join us on Patreon for access to uh, advanced access to live events that access to merch some more fun stuff that's on there um and you can find us on instagram on twitter am i missing anything else ticky talky ticky talky you can find us on the tiktok <laughs> tiktok and non-stop i don't know why i just did that that's and we're bad. losing it that's it we're losing it all right you thank guys you so thank much, you so Jacinda. much for joining us thank you so much jacinda and we will see you all next time Bye. Bye. Character Select is recorded at Slap Studios LA. Executive producers Rick Barrio Dill, Julia Bianco Shuffling, and Anjali Bamani. Producers Bree Curry and Madigan Hunt. Research assistant Amanda Mack. Intro animation by Bree Curry and Larissa Donahue. And additional editing by Josie Scott and theme song by Rick Barrio Dill. The views and opinions stated on this show are those of the individuals and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of their employers. Thanks for listening. <laughs>